Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma ba'da Habitat fillah Continue on in our study of Bulugam Aram The comprehensive book uh, Chapter 3 The Bab Or Chapter Of Asceticism and Piety and we mentioned in the prior lesson, we talked about asceticism, zuhud, and piety, al wara, and that a zuhud, the uh, asceticism is leaving off those things which have no benefit for the hereafter. And al-wara or piety refers to those <coughs> those things which it refers to leaving off that which you have doubt about. Meaning you don't know whether it's halal or haram. You don't know the Hukum Shar with regards to those issues. And we reach the hadith 1267, the second hadith in the in this group of ahadith that Imam Ibn Hajar Rahmatullah Rahmatan Wasiya that he placed in this chapter. And all of this comes under the comprehensive book because these are comprehensive regarding characteristics, mannerisms, and traits. And in fact, if we look at this whole Kitab al-Jami'ah, meaning this last book of uh, Bulugh al-Maram, the comprehensive book, it's comprehensive in its dedication to manners and conduct and the division of those things which are memduh that are praiseworthy traits as we mentioned in the beginning of the chapter in the in the in the first group of a hadith those uh group of hadith which refer to those praiseworthy characteristics the prophetic characteristics those things that the mu'min should possess and should strive to possess in the brotherhood and smiling in the charity from our, our deeds. And then moving on and, and from the Bab, the chapter of Sila, uh, of Bir Wasila, you know, of maintaining the ties of kinship, that these are the characteristics and traits of the Mu'min, as well as maintaining the ties of kinship and maintaining the ties to such an extent that even this has an inclusiveness in a broad sense to maintaining the ties with your neighbor, having good ties with your neighbors and good ties with the believers in general. So all of this has to do with your conduct and your manners and how you uh, re inter interact with one another as believers in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Following the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And all of that, those chapters, they refer to those characteristics which are memdur. That those characteristics which are praiseworthy. And now we've reached the bab of zuhud and wara, which are those group of ahadith which continue on in the same line of of righteousness and piety and good manners and praiseworthy characteristics but they also show us a warning of what uh, of to avoid those things which were unclear about doubtful issues and this is where the zuhud and the wara comes from it comes from to leave those things which are unclear to us those ambiguous issues that can affect our 
deen and our honor, as was in the case in the last lesson in our study of the hadith of Nu'man ibn Bashir radiallahu ta'ala anhu. <clears throat> and then after this chapter, once we finish this group of a hadith, Imam Ibn Hajar will direct us to those group of a hadith which he compiled, which illustrates the characteristics which are madhmoom, those sinful traits, those traits which negate the first group of a hadith, those first characteristics that we're trying to achieve, those uh, characteristics of the mu'min, the characteristics of Ahl sunnah the characteristics of those people of the sunnah who follow the sunnah of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam and the sabil al-mu'mineen and the madhab of the salaf al-salih. That those are the characteristics that we want to possess. But he will take us to those things which he is warning us against, which the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam warned us against and said were negative traits. And some of those, because they are also involve they also have a relationship obviously with wara and zuhud that we leave off those things because they don't benefit us and they cause us harm that we'll find some of those ahadith and traits even in these group of ahadith of the messenger of allah salawatu rabbi wa salamu uh, in the first hadith hadith 1267 meaning the first hadith that we're going to take in this lesson but not the first in the chapter, as we already did that in the prior chapter, in the, the hadith of Nu'man, Ibn Bashir, radiallahu ta'ala an, narrated Abu Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala an, who Allah's messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, said, wretched is the slave of the dinar, the dirham, and the plush cloth. If such a one is given anything of the worldly pleasures, he is pleased with Allah. But if he is not given those things, he is displeased with Allah. And Bukhari reported it. An immense hadith which shows us how to put the dunya in perspective and what to avoid when it comes to how we view the dunya. So you see now the relationship with this hadith with the chapter heading of Zuhud and Wara because those things, uh, zuhud and wara, asceticism and piety, have to do with how we are looking at the dunya, how we operate in the dunya, what we are leaving in the dunya. Unlike those people who are extreme among some of the sects and groups who, who believe that it is from asceticism and piety, so they go beyond the bounds in their understanding. Here we're giving the, the shara boundaries. The bounds in accordance with the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they're giving you boundaries as determined by their own desires and their own intellect. Why they look at asceticism and piety as leaving everything in the dunya. Some of them they leave off marriage. Some of them they leave off cleanliness, hygiene. Some of them they leave off uh, uh, ibadah even. They interpret where Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says in Kitab al Kareem. We, uh, يَعْبُدُ رَبَّكَ حَتَّ يَأْتِيَكُمْ يَقِينَ Or as the ayat is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فِي كِتَابِ الْكَرِيمِ And worship your Lord until uh, certainty. The people of Tajawas, the people who uh, are going beyond the, the limits and believe that they are exhibiting Zuhud and believe that they're exhibiting wara, meaning piety and uh, asceticism. They believe they are exhibiting these traits. They interpret this verse to mean that you can have such a level of yaqeen or certainty that you no longer need to worship Allah. And don't take my word for it, but look into, you, you will find this in your studies, that this is the aqidah, the creed of certain sects certain groups and certain individuals who have went to this to the degree of ilhad they've went to the level of just total heresy of leaving the religion of Islam because they say they no longer have to pray 
those boundaries no longer apply to them of zina. They can cohabitate with whoever and whatever they want. As much time as want, with as many as they want. Because they have no boundaries. Because they reach yaqeen. They believe that Allah is within them. They believe they are one with Allah. They believe all kind of falsified beliefs that have no authority from the book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but it has to do with their desires and their misapplied interpretation and their deviance from the book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that's why it's very important for us to have that clear understanding as Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah, how they, how Ahlul Sunnah defined it, wara and zuhud and understood these nasus, understood these texts that we're studying here today. So in this hadith, the hadith of Abu Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala an, where he said, wretched is the slave of the dinar, the dirham, and the plush cloth. If such a one is given anything in the worldly pleasures, he is pleased with the law, but if he is not given those things, he is displeased with the law, ruahu Bukhari. Uh, what we benefit from this hadith uh, here the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam he referred to the Abd dinar the slave of the dinar and dinar is a type of currency uh, and I believe in places like Kuwait and others that they still that they use uh, their their uh, currency that they use is the dinar in Saudi Arabia they use the rial the Saudi Rial and other countries, they, of course, in America, we use the dollar. In other countries, they have their, their currency that they use. And dinar was a type of uh, currency, and the dirham. And the Emirates, they use dirhams. And so, here the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, referred to the slave of the dinar, and the dirham. And then he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he explained that for us, the meaning of that. And he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, إِذَا عُتِيَا رَضِيَا وَإِنْ لَمْ يُعْتَى لَمْ يَرْضَى He said that this person who's the slave of the dinar, that if they are given from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're pleased with Allah. And if they are not given, then they become displeased with the law. So they have a, such a, a, an extreme love for this, for currency, for wealth and material that this is what dictates their happiness. And let's look at the various ways that Ahl Sunnah looks at uh, this text. And because their pleasure and their displeasure is tied to their acquisition of wealth, only they become a slave to that. And that's very important for us to understand. It's not that they physically go out and when they get their, you know, they have wealth and they just make sujood to it. That's not the understanding of this text. But rather, their happiness and their displeasure is tied to the ownership of things and material and their anger is related to when they are missing that thing instead of having their heart attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they are attached to the material and Imam bin Uthaymin he mentions that there are two ways of viewing this there are two ways of looking at this uh, this text he says, first, that those three things, which are all referring to material, the dinar, the dirham, and uh, the beautified cloth, that all of this material wealth that those things one way to look at it, that this Worship the way that this is worship is that uh, a person's heart is owned by those things. A per person's heart 
becomes owned by the material wealth. And the wealth begins to consume and overpower their heart. This is how they become slaves to it. Because they are overpowered by it. That's their, their, uh, their owner, if you will. The owner of their heart that controls their heart whether they're ple pleased uh, or anger it is wealth and material and it consumes their heart until it becomes their thought process and their intellect or it dictates their intellect intellectual uh, decisions and their motivations everything is related to it they're consumed and the, then the sheikh, he says, وَهَذَا هُوَ حَقِيقَةٌ He says, and this is the reality of worship. Because they're totally consumed by material. And that controls them. So it goes to an extent of that as a type of worship. He says the Wajathani So the, so the, that is the, the those are the uh, uh, the way of looking at this uh, text and then he synthesizes he said this becomes worship in two different from two different uh, angles, if you will, or two different ways. One is that the person begins to become humble and their humility is dictated by wealth and material in that they become pleased only if they, if they have it and they become angry if they don't possess it. So this is how it controls them. And it makes them, you know, they have humility before wealth. They're so consumed by it. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and protect us from this trait, Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. And from that which we possess of these traits, Amin ya Rabbil Alameen wa iyadin billah min dhalika. The second way, he says, is that the heart is owned by it in that it consumes his thought processes, his intellect, his movements, his activities. He strives to achieve it and he doesn't cease to strive in activities unless he att uh, attains that wealth. Meaning that that consumes everything with regards to him and he strives his utmost, and that is is the the end result for them. The end goal is just to attain wealth and be consumed by wealth. So the first way is that the person is humbled by wealth. You know, and their happiness and sadness is totally dictated by the consumption and their attainment of wealth. The second way is that the wealth in and of itself it just consumes and it owns the person and their thought process and their intellect and everything is governed by attaining that wealth and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. The benefits we gain from this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam is first, this hadith is evidence that whatever a person strives for in the dunya to, and they find pleasure in attaining it or anger if they miss it then this is that person is khasa that person is uh, that person has a nux that they are in a loss that person is lost and they are in a loss because they, their happiness and their pleasure 
and their disappointment all comes from wealth. So a person in this state, they are in a loss. This is the first thing we gain from this hadith and the message of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in Kitab al-Kareem, Ya ayyuhaladheena amanu la tulhikum amwalakum wa la awladikum an dhikri Allah. وَمَنْ يَفَذْ ذَلِكَ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُّ الْخَاسِرُونَ So the evidence for that from the book of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the believers, يَا يُوا لَذِينَ آمَنُوا O you who believe, do not uh, become possessed, you know, be obsessed and possessed from your, your children and your wealth. Do not let those things take you away from the remembrance of Allah. So it doesn't mean you can't desire to have wealth and use it for good and use it to live and so forth. That's not what we're saying. That's why you see the shirk is putting everything in its proper place. And Ahl Sunnah looks at these nasus and puts it in their proper place. Unlike those extremists who say, no, we leave off all wealth. I don't even want to work. I'm going to sit in the masjid and pray all day and all night and just supplicate and make dua. I don't want to even earn a living. And my family will be with me and we're just going to rely on tawakkul and we're just going to uh, have zuhud completely in the dunya and asceticism and I'll just take my shower in the masjid when I need to shower once a week, once a month because I am so such a zahid. This is a false understanding. This is batil and this is not from Islam. Wala min Islam fi shay. This is not zuhud. That is not asceticism. That is not the piety and the, the uh, asceticism that Islam is calling to. Islam is just telling you, no, this dunya, you can have in this dunya. You can be wealthy in this dunya. But use it for the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not let it consume you. Do not let it possess you. Do not worship it to where your pleasure and your anger is all coming from your attainment of that wealth. And, and achieving wealth. And don't let that consume your thought processes and so forth. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us to practice this because it's, it can be very difficult because we all are tainted in one form or another, but some of us are favored to be truly zahid where it doesn't enter the heart. It isn't in their heart, the wealth and the attainment of wealth, but some of us are consumed by it to greater and lesser extent. And may Allah protect us from worshipping other than Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so in the ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the believers. And He says, do not let your wealth and your children uh, take you away from the remembrance of Allah. And whoever does this, then they are the khasirun. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lets us know that they're khasir, as we mentioned. That they're the khasirun. They're, they're, one, they're the people in the loss. They're in a loss because they allowed the dunya to consume them. Even if it was their beautiful family. Even if it was this and that. But they allowed that to consume them over the obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we've seen countless examples where the people took to the extreme. They didn't do any talab al ilm They didn't do anything because it was just purely about pleasing their family. And often you see in the end they became of the khasirin. I know one person, an individual personally, he left Islam. Because he didn't advance, he didn't give himself soul food by seeking knowledge to better himself. But he was so busy with worrying about his family, he didn't, then it was easy when Shibahat, doubtful things came to him, he was knocked off his religion. So that's why it's very important to not be consumed by anything over the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, over your obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, over your worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and knowing and understanding more about uh, uh, your, your deen. And may Allah bless us with Another benefit of this hadith of the Message of Allah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is this hadith also is evidence that it is necessary for a person to strive <coughs> to remove the dunya from their heart. So it, and that is so that way they don't become humbled to the dunya and become a servant of the dunya. And that might be an accurate way of articulating it, becoming a slave or a servant of of this worldly life. Yes, again, we already explained the balanced way that yes, you can possess property. Yes, you can own things. Yes, you can buy things. Yes, you can be happy about attaining wealth and using it for good, but not allowing it to consume your heart 
And that's the whole point. It's the heart. And it goes back to the hadith of Nu'man Ibn Bashir, where he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet said, Allah wa hiya qalb. Either either salaha salaha jizil kullu, or either fasada fasada jizil kullu, Allah wa hiya qalb. If the heart is sick, then the whole body is sick. If the heart is healthy, the whole body is healthy. And he, and he mentioned it was the heart. And if he jizid madgha then, either salaha salaha jizid kullu. In the body, there's a morsel of flesh. If the, uh, if the whole body, if the, the, this morsel of flesh is healthy, the whole body is healthy. If it's sick, the whole body is sick. And then he said, ala wa qalb. And it's the heart. And so if your heart is consumed by this dunya, by material wealth, the acquisition of wealth, that's all you think about, then that's going to make everything else sick. And that's going to make you possessed by that thing. And you can become a worshiper of that, of that wealth and material. And it affects everything. It destroys your deen and your dunya. Uh, another, and then be of the Khasidi. Another benefit of this hadith and the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is this hadith also points us to a very important uh, point is that this hadith uh, illustrates for us that if a, a person, their heart becomes consumed by something or totally attached to something, and the, the sheikh, he mentioned, he said, Ta'liqan tamma. Complete attachment. We're not just saying you, you are attached. You're attached to your loved ones. You're attached to your, your property. You're atta I'm attached to my books. I'm attached to different things. We're attached to things. But if it becomes complete attachment, where your heart is totally, your, your joy and your, your sorrow is related to this, these material things, the acquisition or the loss of it, to where, you know, it, it can reach a level of being, of becoming a budiya, you know, of worship. So you have to put everything in perspective and not have your heart consumed by anything material. <clears throat> Another last benefit of this hadith is that it shows us that a person, their pleasure and their displeasure should be in accordance with what pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what displeases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the next hadith, hadith 1268 narrated Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam caught hold of my shoulders and said, be in the world as though you were a stranger or a wayfarer. Ibn Umar عنه, used to say, if you are alive in the evening, <clears throat> do not expect to be alive till the morning. And if you are alive in the morning, do not expect to be alive till the evening. And take from your health for your sickness and from your life for your death. Ruahu Bukhari. In this hadith, uh, this narration of Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got hold of his shoulders and said, Be in the world as though you were a stranger or a traveler or a wayfarer. This hadith, <clears throat> and we see the relevance of this hadith in this chapter, is that this hadith illustrates the importance of not being attached and consumed by this worldly life. And it goes back to the last hadith that we mentioned and this whole group of a hadith in the Bab of Zuhud Wal Wara, the chapter of asceticism and piety, that <clears throat> to put everything in perspective, that a person should possess wara and zuhud in the dunya and leaving off as much as possible those things which have no benefit for you in the hereafter. And that a person's heart should not be consumed by this worldly life. <clears throat> and this hadith in which the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
gave immensely important advice for us to practice because he sallallahu alayhi wa said kun fi dunya ka'annaka gharib be in the world as if you are a stranger <clears throat> as if you're a foreigner and a person who's gharib you know, who's, who's a foreigner or a stranger in a land, that means they're like passing through the place in which they reside in as a temporary resident, so to speak. They're passing through, so that means they don't have immense attachments. That doesn't mean we cannot have, because we look at the, this nus in accordance with other texts. That doesn't mean we can't have dunya. That's not the understanding, and that's why we're trying to emphasize giving us the proper understanding of this, <coughs> this text. It doesn't negate having wealth and using it for khair and having things in this dunya and having family and washing yourself and all the other things that a person does and functions in this life. But it does negate being attached extremely attached and consumed. That's what we mean by attached. That you're attached, that your happiness and your sadness is a result of that. Your humility is a result of that. And you're humbled before your material wealth. And you're consumed by it. And we know countless stories of people who are consumed by material. Look at all the famous people and all the people of, uh, of status and people who kill themselves when they lose their wealth. And when they take a loss, a financial loss. And that's because their ubudiyah is not to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their ubudiyah is to their mal, is to their wealth. And they didn't travel in this life, as the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned, as a stranger, but rather they traveled, they indulged in everything. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ad dunya sijin al mu'min jinnat al kafir, that the, the, the worldly life, it is a prison for the believer and it is a, it's the paradise of the disbeliever. And so engaging and indulging to the fullest extent, and it's especially with the heart, that this is mithmoon, <clears throat> this is sinful, and this is takes you away from obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From this hadith and this narration, the benefits that uh, we gain from this, some of the benefits are, first it shows us the hirs, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in advising his Ummah with that which will benefit them. That he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was concerned about our guidance and concerned with uh, uh, giving us direction and that which would, would benefit us. Another benefit of this hadith is that the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as we mentioned prior to this used excellent uh, examples that people could understand and relate to in order to affirm either a ruling or to affirm uh, how one should practice and understand and, and, and operate in this life. So the Prophet Ali Salatu Salam here as with the hadith of Nu'man ibn Bashir where he uh, you know, used his hands to illustrate and, and the Prophet ﷺ on one condition, one occasion said, Atakwa hauna, and he was pointing to his heart. Uh, and as we mentioned, the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ drew a line in the sand, and there's countless ahadith of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ where he gave examples and illustrations and uh, pointed and gave body language and gestures to emphasize the point, to emphasize what the message he was trying to convey and in order for the to, to become clear to the people and in order for them to comprehend and be able to practice and relate to the example he used it in language he used it in body language and he uh you know <clears throat> also demonstrated by actually uh doing physical gestures and actions Another uh, benefit of this hadith
is we learn from this hadith <clears throat> is that we should not be consumed by this dunya, as, as this worldly life, as if this is our permanent abode. And so we have to have our time for that hereafter, and we have to use this dunya in, as a, a means to benefit us for the hereafter. So it doesn't mean we can't attain wealth, as we mentioned, but if you do attain wealth, make sure it's halal, and use it for halal. But one should be as a stranger in this life in that they are not, their heart is not attached to it and consumed by this life. That they're looking to the hereafter. They're looking how to use the, that which they attain for good and to achieve the hereafter. <clears throat> uh, another benefit of this hadith that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam is that we see uh, that the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't prohibit us from uh, indulging in the dunya at all uh, in an absolute sense. That we are, we are allowed to partake, of course, in this worldly life and we need to, to attain goals and to achieve positive. But it's just, it's muqayyid, it's restricted. It's restricted to khair, to righteousness. And to, as a wasila, as a means to get to the end, which is the hereafter. Not as a means in and of itself, and something that consumes the heart. So we don't take this life, we just want to collect books just for the sake of collecting books. But no, we want to collect these Islamic books, for example, to help us for the hereafter. To, to, to better understand the religion. To share the knowledge we can obtain from these books and articulate that and share that with others to pass it on to others so these are a this these things the worldly things should be a means not an end an end in in and of themselves and in the narration where we see that ibn umar radiyallahu ta'ala said that if a person uh reaches the evening then do not wait for the morning you know do not do not expect to see the morning uh this statement of Ibn Omar it's very important for us to understand this this is not from pessimism this is not from being negative and thinking oh I'm just gonna die and I'm gonna get sick and da -da -da. no but rather this is putting the dunya in perspective and that a person should use the time now to obey and worship Allah and do good deeds. As the Salaf used to say, a dunya dar al amal, wal akhira dar al jaza. That this worldly life is the abode of doing actions. You know, this is the time to do your actions and your deeds and your righteous goodness. And the hereafter is the time to reap what you sowed. Meaning that if you did good, you'll see it in the hereafter. If you did bad, you'll see it in the hereafter. So it's very important to use the time now while you have health. Now, while you have youth. Now. Why you have time, if you have those things. Now, why you have wealth, if you have wealth to do good. That all of those things are very important and they assist you in obedient, being obedient to Allah and they can deter you from being obedient to Allah if you're not using them properly. So that's very important to have that correct understanding of this as Umar, Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala said, خُذْ مِنْ سِيهَتُكَ سِيهَتِكَ لِسَقَمِكَ That take from your your health
uh, to prepare for your sickness, so to speak, or to um, <clears throat> take from your health for your sickness. So that while you have health, use it, use it for good before you become sick and you can't do. And an example is when, for example, we see many older people and people who are not active, they may not even be that old, but they're not active or they suffer from some ailments and they're, they're unable to pray uh, standing, for example. They have to sit in chairs. And if you injure yourself, you can relate. If you have any injury, especially when it has to do with your legs or your feet or something like this, you break something, you sprain something, you can relate and you get a chance to experience that where you have to pray sitting down. And you can then you can relate and you see the importance of being obedient and having the luxury of having health and being able to stand, to be able to stand and make sujood and... Uh, prostrate before Allah subhanahu subhanahu wa ta'ala that this is a luxury so use your health for obedience to Allah or in fact when you become so sick and you can't even leave your home how many people they get so sick then they, they're bedridden so when they are in their health they we hope that they use it for good and that's when you begin to appreciate it <clears throat> so it's very important for us to be on obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do that now while we have the blessings uh, that we have from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and <clears throat> also from that excellent advice as it shows us this hadith illustrates for us the zuhd in the dunya the importance of having that asceticism in the dunya and the meaning and that that we don't take this worldly life as a permanent abode and just compile uh, just uh, compile wealth and compile material and strive and, and attach our heart to it because it can go at any time and it will go at one time and you can't take it with you or rather you want to use this for obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the next hadith, hadith uh, 1269 narrated Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, he who imitates any people is one of them. Uh, Abu Dawood reported it and Ibn Hiban graded it sahih. So in this hadith of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he said, Men bikomen minhum. Whoever resembles a people is from them. And this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam <clears throat> shows us the danger of resembling people of sin, people of wickedness, people of bid'ah, people of disbelief. And that the mu'min has the identity <clears throat> an important identity to fulfill, and that's the identity of being a proud, not arrogant, proud believer in the religion of Islam, proud follower of the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, being a person of honor, and following the way and resembling the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. And there are many ways in which a person can resemble <coughs> a people. And that can be through their through Aqidah, uh, through creed. For example, falling into shirk. And this is part of the context of this hadith. That the nation of Islam, meaning the Muslims, would follow and resemble the way of other nations. And we see that in so many ways, in that the Ummah of Muhammad wasallam, there are some people who, uh, from the nation of Muslims, have fallen into 
uh, shirk and disobedience to Allah and, and various acts of bid'ah in ibadah, in worship. And there are some who resemble other nations through their dress and through their various ways of worship, things which are not sanctioned by the shara. And they resemble other nations through their adat, through their habits, and through their mannerisms. And so that's very important for us to realize that Islam is complete, and it's a complete system, and we are commanded, or we are prohibited from resembling other uh, nations and follow, taking that as our sunnah. But rather, we have a, a creed. We have a system of worship. We have a, <clears throat> a methodology of da'wah. We have a adat and habits that are Islamic habits, not according to a particular culture, but Islamic habits that we, we are ordered to follow that come from the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. And so we have to be cautious about following other nations in their various uh, ways. And this also includes manners that, and this perhaps is some of the relevance of this hadith in this chapter, in that the mannerisms and the ways of Islam are to be followed, not the ways of disbelief and other nations, especially if it contradicts uh, Islamic uh, mannerisms. So we have a system in, in how we should interact with one another in accordance with the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What we learn from this hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is this hadith uh, is a encouragement to resemble the Salihin, to resemble the righteous, pious ones, at beginning with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions, Radiallahu Ta'ala Anhu Majma'in in the Salaf al Salih, Ridwan Allahi Alayhim. And we understand that because the Prophet said, Men minhum. Whoever resembles a people, then he is from them. If you want to be from the Ummah of Muhammad, if you want to be risen and resurrected, uh, you know, Yom uh, al uh, with the Prophet in the Salihin, the Salaf al Salih, then those are the ones you want to resemble. You want to resemble them in their manners. You want to resemble them. You want to resemble the Prophet as the Asl. And then those things which the Salaf had ijma or consensus on, that that is what you take, you know, that's the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. That's what we want. <clears throat> and that's what we are ordered to do. And that is resembling the Sari'een. And then la'allallah and yaj'ala minhum. In hopes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make us from amongst them. <clears throat> uh, another benefit of this hadith, this hadith uh, encourages is a hath, and this is far'an, or this is a, as a, a branch of what we just talked about. It is an encouragement to follow the Salaf al-Salih. This hadith is an encouragement to follow the Salaf al-Salih. How is that? Because the Prophet ﷺ said, Men minhum. Whoever resembles a people, then he is from them. So this encourages us to follow the righteous. This encourages us to follow the Salaf. The Salaf al-Salih, the righteous, uh, the pious predecessors, the pious predecessors. Because the Prophet Sallallahu said, Alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnat al-Khulafa al-Rashidin al-Mahdiin. He said, it's upon you, the su my sunnah and the sunnah of the rightly guided Khalifa, meaning Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, wa Ali, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu majma'een. They make up the first generation, they are the Salaf. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, خَيْرَ النَّاسْ قَرْنِي ثُمَّ الَّذِينِ يَلُونُهُمْ ثُمَّ الَّذِينِ يَلُونُهُمْ The best people is my generation, then those who follow them, then those who follow them. That's the Salaf al-Salih. That's the uh, 
the first three generations. So this hadith encourages us to follow them, to be on their path, because we want to resemble them. We want to be from amongst them, because the Prophet Sallallahu praised them, and Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala praised them. Tabarak wa Ta'ala. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith is a warning against resembling uh, disbelievers. <clears throat> And, of course, Ahlul Bid'ah and the people of sin. So this hadith warns us because the Prophet ﷺ said, فَهُوَ مِنْهُمْ Then he is from them. Who wants to be from amongst the sinners? Who wants to be amongst the people of, uh, of Ahlul Nar, the people of the hellfire? Who wants to be from the people of deviance and the people of misguidance and the people of sin? All of them have the threat of wa'id over them. They all have the threat of punishment, the promise of punishment over them. Wa'iyadi billah min dhalika. Another benefit of this hadith is that in general, uh, Ben Uthaymin, he mentions, he says, أَنَّهُ مَتَى حَصَلَ شُبَى أو شَبَى ثَبَتُ الْحُكُمْ that when resemblance, when there is resemblance, this affirms the hukum. So that means when you get a haircut, even if you didn't intend it, but the haircut is exclusively the style of non-Muslims, you did it, even though you didn't want to look like Ronaldo or you didn't want to look like this one or that one, necessarily, yeah, it wasn't in your intention, but that has just become acceptable to you, and, and that is not known from the Muslims, Aslan, then you, by doing that, making that tishbi, that resemblance, that has affirmed that hukum. Fuhuwa minhum. So it's very important for us, it's a stern warning for us to strive our best to follow the sunnah of the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and leave off trying to resemble other nations and being weak. And that means resembling them, of course, in their mannerisms and those and, and dress and those things which <clears throat> contradict the shara. And that is a whole big bab uh, which we're not going to open, but perhaps in lessons of fiqh and other lessons, you will go into more detail. With regards to that, uh, another a last benefit of this hadith that we'll mention is this hadith is a stern warning against following also as we mentioned uh, ahl bid'ah, and that's because the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in another hadith kulu bid'atan darala wa kulu daralatan fanar every innovation is a leading astray and every leading astray is a uh, is in the hellfire. So why would you want to resemble a people? who are going astray and who are traversing the path of the hellfire. So that shows us that it is important to follow the sunnah, the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in accordance with the madhab, the minhaj, the methodology of the Salaf al-Saleh, Ridwan Allahi alayhim, and avoid the various controversies in bid'ah of the other groups because that leads you to the fire. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Men for whom men whom, whoever resembles a people, then he is from them. So if you resemble and you follow the way, of Ahl Bid'ah and Zandaka and the heretics, then you'll be from them. That means that hukum, that they uh, have the ruling that is applicable to them will be applicable to you. And you don't, of course, want to resemble anything except that which is good. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jal the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil and forgive us of our many shortcomings and the many sins that we incur. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.